Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Amy King, uh, and I'm a lecturer here in the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the ANU. Uh, I have great pleasure this morning in welcoming you to another of our keynote lectures, um, this time this morning on the subject of the rise of China, something that I know is of interest to many people here in Canberra and, of course, more broadly around the region. Uh, and to take us through this subject, um, we'll be welcoming Dr. Francis Khan, who I had the great pleasure to, to meet uh, last year on a trip to Taiwan, um, and who I was very, very um, impressed with and learned a great deal from um, when we, we discussed uh, issues around regional security, the US-China-Taiwan uh, China relationship, uh, and the strategic environment of the Asia-Pacific more generally. Francis um, has, a, has a very um, important perspective on these issues, having served time in both university life and in government in Taiwan. Uh, he recently completed a two-year stint as the senior advisor to the National Security Council in Taiwan and is now an associate professor uh, at National Junction University in the Department of Diplomacy. He's also uh, worked at, at the University of Cambridge where he completed his PhD uh, at Yale University in the United States. Uh, and so he brings a wealth of experience both internationally uh, and, on, and from Taiwan uh, to these issues. He'll be speaking today on the subject or the question really of the rise of China or the rejuvenation or the renaissance of China. Um, something that really is a, two very different ways of looking at this question and the implications uh, of the different ways of looking at this question. So as with our previous keynote speakers, uh, Francis will be speaking for about 45 minutes or so uh, and then we'll have about half an hour for, uh, for questions and answers. Uh, so would you please join with me in welcoming Francis to speak. Thank you very much indeed, um, Amy. Uh, I hear colleagues from Australia, from <coughs> Taiwan, from elsewhere. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, it's really my great honor to be invited uh, to share some of my observations. Uh, I attend uh, both from when I was working in the government and also my uh, long academic years in uh, campus. Um, the, um, the reason I chose this topic, uh, the right of China or the great renaissance of the Chinese nation implication for all of us. As uh, Amy pointed out, this is a question uh, I like to, um, I have asked myself for uh, quite a uh, few months already, but I am also asking you uh, that, um, Let's uh, all together uh, think of the, the topic and what actually would, uh, what implication it bring to us. Uh, before that, um, I'd like to thank the, um, uh, the main organizer. Uh, when I was in the government, uh, I had uh, many good opportunities to work with your best ambassador to, to Taiwan, Ambassador Maggie. Uh, we uh, work very closely and we have many occasion to talk about our bilateral relations, um, but also our relation with the U.S. and also our very peculiar relation with mainland China. Uh, that, that experience really made me feel that our two countries share a lot of uh, commonalities uh, in addition to differences. And one of the uh, key elements that we share is that you are an ally of the United States, and we are anyway good friend of the U.S. too. And what uh, that would be, um, I mean, I, what that would mean to, to us <coughs> at the very crucial time when China is continuing to rise. Uh, so um, I, I think of the, the the two terms. I mean, the rise of China. Uh, for most of us, we, we would tend to believe that. Rise of China only happened last year or a few years ago. No, if you check a, a website 30 years ago, people already talk about the rise of China. So what, what would be the difference uh, now from, say, 20 years ago? And what would be the difference from uh, now and 20 years down the road? I will tell you that 20 years down the road would be very, very different. <clears throat> but for many Chinese, 
They're not only talking about the rise of China, actually they really talk about the rise of China. They talk about the great renaissance of the Chinese nation in Chinese, 中中华民族伟大复兴 But I know that um, these are two different uh, concepts in two different settings. The rise of China, particularly for outside uh, observers, would mean that um, you know, China has arisen uh, from nowhere. It's a poor country, it's a democratic country, uh, it has uh, endured kind of a national humiliation for so many years, it has endured the, um, uh, the uh, cultural revolution, you name it. But for many Chinese, uh, and, and, and I argue a bit later, it's not only for certain group of people, it's for both the elites, for the political leaders, for business, um, um, the CEO, for a chairman, for whoever, and also for people on the streets, they have the same objective. It is very rare, right? In Australia, different parties would have different souls not to mention Taiwan, right? We have a green and, and blue, and uh, in the US you have Tea Party, you have whoever. Mm -hmm. But in China, this country which has um, 1.3 billion people, all of them almost have the same soul. What would be the soul? I'm going to tell you a bit later. Now, what I'm going to do is actually not only ask one question, but five. Starting from, is China really rising to the point that it could match the US? I mean, if it's not, uh, there's no reason that we are sitting here today. And if this is the case, what is China's worldview? I mean, this is going to be very important for all of us. And Will China observe, bypass, or overthrow the existing order? The order we have been um, so familiar for so many years. In the past 60 years, we know that uh, in the uh, early stage, after the end of the uh, Second World War, we have um, the, the, the bipolar international system. Then after late 80s, early 90s, then we have the only sole great power in the United States. And we are very happy with that, right? But uh, what, what will happen if China becomes uh, capable of uh, challenging the U.S. preeminence? Fourthly, is the U.S. losing its hegemonic position? I mean, it really depends also upon the U.S. Uh, how to respond to the new situation. And finally, uh, what would be the implication for all of us. Let me start from this question. You know, sometimes when we talk about the rise of China, uh, if you are military professional, you are thinking about uh, you know, how powerful now the uh, POA is going to be. If you are a, a, a physics person, you talk about uh, economics. But Overall, uh, when uh, I'm talking about the rise of China, I'm thinking all dimensions. But today I only choose three, economic, military, and culture. They combine as the overall national strength. So let me start from economic dimensions. Now you can see, uh, we all know that the China start is the, uh, the so-called reform and open up uh, period from 1978. At that time, the uh, overall national GDP is only 150 billion. And today, two years ago, is around a bit more than 8,000. Today is already uh, not 9,000. How many times? 55. I uh, just name any other country that could develop in such a rapid uh, pace. Uh, so we can see Shanghai and elsewhere. Uh, this is how we have been uh, witnessing China's economic growth in the past 35 years also. 
This uh, um, diagram shows the figure about the Chinese real GDP growth per year. And again, uh, when you started the uh, reform uh, era, starting from the 70s, uh, and at some point, the uh, annual economic uh, growth rate could uh, be as high as 15 percent. And there are some years in the past 35 years uh, that actually exceed 10 percent. Uh, so many people said that China's economic growth always maintain 10 percent. It's not right. But the overall uh, and the average of the economic growth rate in the past uh, 35 years is around 10 percent. But uh, there were also some years, particularly uh, 1890, and, and you know what happened, right? Tiananmen Square, uh, many, particularly Western investors, withdrew from the mainland. Only a few stayed there, including Taiwanese. Um, and in the mid uh, 90s, and sometime before the 2008, the global economic downturn. Uh, in the past a couple of years, it remain uh, almost under eight, uh, and, and many economists uh, predicted that it's, it's going to be very difficult for the Chinese to continue to grow uh, to remain at the uh, anything above eight percent. And I don't know whether you still remember a few years ago, uh, people argued that one uh, of the elements that could maintain the CCP's legitimacy would be the economic, economic growth rate continuing exceeding 8%. I didn't buy it. Uh, uh, one region cannot uh, be um, surviving uh, only based upon one uh, in, indicator. But anyway, this shows how China has been here today. <clears throat> this slide shows the, um, also the uh, annual growth rate and also the overall um, amount of uh, the, uh, China's foreign reserve in the past uh, 20 years. Uh, again, uh, starting from uh, something like uh, 1993, it's almost zero. And uh, last year, 2014, is around 4 trillion. And a uh, few years later, it's going to be almost Seven trillion. So the um, the, the build up the uh, the foreign reserve really goes up very quickly. And if we compare China with the U.S., surely, I, although I'm not an economist, we all know that um, the U.S. has some reason uh, it doesn't really need that much the foreign reserve. But I, I like to argue that the. Um, the reason China really uh, likes to keep its uh, foreign reserve so much is that it likes to use as, uh, as a leverage to influence not only its relations with the U.S., but also uh, countries around. But you still can see the, the very large margin between the two countries in terms of the foreign reserve. <coughs> now, manufacturing output. Um, we point out five countries here. Uh, Italy has some big name. Uh, Germany, uh, as, as we all know, Germany is a, a big country in terms of uh, manufacturing. However, uh, this is Germany, the green, uh, the green line. Uh, in the past uh, three or four decades, uh, Italy and Germany remain well, they, they uh, did work, but uh, the, um, the speed uh, was pretty slow. Uh, this is somewhere we are more familiar with. Japan, particularly in the early 90s, there was a time when um, everyone talked about Japan is going to be number one. Even then, uh, the, 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 the number one we talk about is all about economic, it's all about trade, all about manufacturing. No one talk about that Japan is going to pose any military 
uh, not to mention diplomatic um, kind of uh, competitiveness vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. And this is the US. So it's a very healthy economy. Um, and the US is continuing to rise in a very steady uh, speed. And China starting from nowhere. So that, that's why people are talking about right of China, right of China at all times. It is really starting from zero and now they are up and down, but uh, I'm sorry, China is this one. So a couple of years ago, uh, some years ago, uh, China has already exceeded the US to become the world's number one manufacturing um, or what we call the world's factory. Now let me um, also ask a very interesting question. The first time when the IMF uh, um, actually um, announced this uh, uh, data some years ago, and we certainly uh, found out that there will be a time in very uh, uh, remote future that China may one day become the world's number one in economic terms. And no one has actually well prepared for that. Uh, and at that time, the IMF has predicted that there may be 2030. And if you still recall, many of us, including I myself, was asking, no, no way. 2030, maybe the, the end of the, the century, China will become number one. And that was, at least as far as I'm aware, that was the very first time that we knew that one day, although it's still remote, China is going to be the world's number one. But the date has been grown earlier and earlier since then. So the economist has also predicted that the year of 2026 will be the year that the US will be replaced by China. <coughs> and that was almost the first time that we knew that uh, it's going to happen soon. Again, we knew that it's going to happen before the year 2020. And you remember a uh, few uh, seconds ago, I said that the economy is predicted the year will be 2026. And recently, they have been advised by the economists that before 2017, this is already early uh, 2015. Actually, uh, they would have a different uh, various, various, uh, various uh, statistics to uh, assess uh, a country's uh, overall G GDP. In some, uh, according to some statistics, China has already exceeded the U.S. last year, uh, although it's not still not officially confirmed. Uh, yet, um, anyway, it's going to happen either this year or next year. So, um, economically, we believe that there's no doubt that China will become the number one. How about military dimension? Because uh, both uh, Australia and, and Taiwan, we know how, um, how strong, how powerful the uh, POA has become, particularly after the uh, POA has adopted the um, kind of revolutionary reform uh, after the year of 1996-97 uh, when uh, the U.S. sent the two aircraft group, uh, aircraft group um, uh, to uh, somewhere in between the Taiwan Strait in preventing both sides both side from escape, es escalating the, uh, the conflict. Uh, China knew that it needed to have a very powerful maritime capabilities. So this uh, slide shows that this is the first Chinese aircraft carrier 
learning hub. And uh, there will be at least two more uh, on the way. We talk about China's economic growth and military power always borrow economic growth. Uh, again, starting from like uh, 1989 and till a couple of years ago, this is China's published military budget. And for some of you who know China's uh, military so much, this is only a official figure. Uh, some American and European uh, expert predict that the uh, real number would be at least double, uh, uh, or even some of them uh, assess that there would be uh, four times. Uh, I mean, four times would be the two, a bit too much. But it, again, it also depends upon uh, what elements you you actually uh, uh, counting. For instance, the uh, armed police um, can be used as military. Uh, in, in, in the event of any eventuality. So, uh, but the Chinese exclude the uh, armed police uh, from uh, the uh, military uh, uh, the budget uh, uh, counting. But uh, there, there have been various uh, statistics too. Now, this is the um, Annual growth rate. Uh, we, uh, I can only find this uh, uh, <coughs> this uh, slide. But actually, in the past uh, a couple of years, uh, the the annual rate, the, the annual growth rate of the military spending of the POA Act has been rising again. And these growth compared with the economic growth rate as we have uh, released some while ago is much higher than economics uh, counterpart. So that actually made the uh, POA a very capable and very formidable uh, tool to be uh, compared with. Having said that, uh, the US, the, the overall military spending of the United States still exceed the combination of the all next eight or nine country altogether. Uh, US, uh, particularly the US experts always uh, argue that China uh, need to build up is actually posing a great threat to many countries around. Uh, but uh, the Chinese uh, counterparts also argue that, you know, compared with you, we are still very kind of a smooth potato, okay? Uh, so these are the next uh, eight big military uh, countries, and overall, their overall budget is still less than the uh, the U.S. Um, this picture shows the um, the rate the rating the rating of, of uh, the biggest. Uh, military. Now we need people, professional people, to fight the war. We need tanks to do the uh, ground battlefield. We need aircraft to defend our air. We need nuclear warheads to uh, pose any kind of deterrence. We need aircraft carriers um, to uh, implement uh, our military strategy. And we need someone to do the 3D war worship <coughs> quietly. But we need money to do all those things. So although um, China was listed as number three in this number three in this uh, list, um, <coughs> if we consider many of these elements, China is already kind of a number two, although the difference between number one and number two is still too large to, to bridge. Um, well, this is a, a more interesting uh, diagram to, to look at. The, uh, the top line and the four line, the 
difference between them is that the, 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 the four line is actually official POA budget, and the dot line is what the um, London based think tank double double S has uh, estimated. Uh, as you could see, uh, the, earl the earliest possible day that the uh, even in military terms, the Chinese is going to replace the U.S. as the world's number one. Uh, remember what we have seen before: uh, the big difference in terms of the military budget. Yet, according to the uh, continuing uh, rise of the Chinese POA military spending, the earliest day would be not too remote. Uh, it is going to happen in maybe 10 to 15 years down the way. Even uh, the, re the, the most remote day will still be sometime before the mid of this century. And it is really some very alarming picture that we are looking at. Uh, we would actually have been thinking that I mean, even in long term, uh, there are different uh, statistics, right? Uh, what we have been talking about is the overall GDP um, amount. And China has, anyway, around uh, four times of uh, the U.S. population. So this is a, a, a vast land. This is a very big country. So um, according to the population, uh, we still could understand why China could become number one in economic terms. But in military terms, uh, many of us, even a military expert sitting in this room, will still uh, be um, um, surprised to see uh, how soon it is going to happen. Now let's look at a, 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 a softer uh, dimension of the overall uh, national strength. We all know that China has established the Confucius Institute. Uh, to compare the um, the uh, national strengths in terms of culture, really a difficult a diff difficult uh, task. Uh, we all watch the Hollywood movies. Uh, we all listen to the American music. We hardly listen to Chinese music, right? Uh, a, a couple of uh, Chinese movies are good, but not all of them. Uh, so it really. Uh, difficult to compare that in a cultural term. But at least China has a, uh, a try very hard to also to compete with its American counterparts in uh, culture. Uh, this is the number of the establishment of the uh, Confucian, Confucius Institute in the past uh, decade also. And the Confucian skill is all, all around the world. Uh, although uh, recently, in the past a couple of years, there are some American universities, I don't know how about uh, Australia, and also in uh, Western Europe, they uh, start to continue the uh, contract with the Confucian Institute because they believe that the Institute actually has done something else other than culture. Uh, still, I mean, uh, yeah, they, these are figures showing that the, how, how much the Chinese wanted to compete uh, with the U.S. This uh, show that there are some uh, comparison between these two great powers. Uh, uh, some of them are more relevant to what we are talking about. For instance, the, um, well, the film industry, as I said, the American uh, film, the American movies uh, are still much, much more appealing to the global uh, viewers than the Chinese. But um, say um, here, Olympic uh, medals, uh, that, that was the figure uh, for the year for 2012. Uh, in the past two years, I, I remember uh, saying um, the London Olympic Games, I think the number has been, uh, the, the two figures have been closer, um, and some other figures too. So uh, even in mid, uh, cultural terms, uh, there are some comparison that Chinese uh, 
actually bridging their uh, gap with their uh, uh, American counterparts. Um, this is a public opinion poll taken in um, um, Latin America and Africa uh, to show actually many of them believe that the U.S. and the Chinese share the, almost the same level uh, in terms of uh, their uh, perspective and the per perception of the American and Chinese so power. Overall, um, we are asking the question, is China or will China be the world's number leading superpower very soon? Uh, there are several, uh, there are many countries here, um, well, some of them, for instance, in North America, uh, some of them believe, and the vast, vast majority of them believe that China is going to be superpower and uh, some countries in the middle. But uh, this gives us a, 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 a kind of overall image that the people around the world really recognize that China is or will be the world's superpower. Now, the next question I'm going to ask is what is China's worldview if China is rising? in such a rapid pace. Uh, the China's the worldview is going to determine what action it is going to take. Look at this picture. China actually placed itself in the center of the wall and the image is bigger and bigger. If we really want to know China's mindset about its global and regional position. We have to date it back to almost 5,000 years ago, and Chinese uh, deeply believe that China had the, the 5,000 years of civilization. It is the most enduring one, and it still survives. Um, and uh, what, what is particularly special for the Chinese people is that it's not only a nation. It is a state, it is a country. So this is a nation state that has uh, experienced several and uh, many periods of up and down and even invaded by uh, other uh, you know, races like uh, the uh, uh, Yuan Dynasty and Qing Dynasty and it has endured, as I said, the, um, by the Western imperialism, gunboat diplomacy starting from 18. 42 all the way until last century, uh, China still survived. And, and that is and, and, uh, what actually openly Chinese people believe that China is a special nation and also is a special state. Literally, China, Zhongguo, uh, I found that some Western analysts use the wrong interpretation. China, Zhongguo means Middle Kingdom. No, China never see itself as middle, never as a, a, a middle-sized country. It's always big and vast. So China means, Zhong means center. Guo is not state, Guo is universe. So China is the center of the universe. I try to be, uh, 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 make a Chinese a bit humble, the center of the, the, the entire globe. Um, so the world's number one uh, on all dimension were actually uh, the uh, phenomenon uh, for so many years. I'm going to show some of the statistics a bit later. Yet the nation's strengths have been declining after the year 1820. I'm going to show you this is a, this is a magic number, 1820. <coughs> So the Chinese have endured the 200 years of national humiliation uh, because this is a term, a very special term, uh, that Chinese have always been entertained for so many years. I mean, even when we were small, even when we were uh, Taiwanese, uh, we have been educated uh, by uh, our 
test books that the Chinese have been uh, <coughs> in such a, a, a hardship uh, period of time. Um, and that is all due to uh, the Western imperialism. Um, and starting from late Qing Dynasty and Ming Guo, uh, uh, the, the Republic uh, appear, uh, politicians have taken all sorts of reform. And there's only one end to recover from where China was after the year of um, uh, almost uh, 1800. <coughs> Now, let me show you the magic number. 1820. Um, China. This is for China, Red China. Um, this shows the, uh, the share of the, the, uh, the world GDP. China and India, they com combine together, accounted for more than half of the world. GDP. Yet, India uh, was not the uh, uh, unified country uh, the state from time to time, uh, but not China. Uh, but starting from 1820, the, uh, the share of the world's GDP has been declined <coughs> rapidly until the 80s. Again, Again, uh, many economists have um, uh, done a very uh, comprehensive examination about when and why and, and, and how the Chinese have been uh, declining for so long and for um, has been have been uh, in such a, a destructive way. Uh, and they all point to, to the year of, uh, around the year of uh, 1800. Interestingly, 1820, if you know China, China's history a little bit, this is a year that uh, we know that the uh, Qianlong has been there for many years, 60 years. And that was the, the, uh, uh, the peak of, uh, of a Chinese uh, uh, power in terms of the strength and also in terms of the territory. And in Qianlong's Qing Dynasty, the um, territory is even larger than what China has now. But um, in late, um, in late um, uh, 18th century, Qianlong passed the power to who? To Jiaqing. And 1820 is the year Jiaqing passed the power to Daoguang. And we all knew that Daoguang, particularly Daoguang, Daoguang uh, 20 years, the um, 20 years after Daoguang took power, and 22 years after that, uh, the OP, opium war actually happened. So I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about the details of the history. I just like to let you know that uh, there, there must be some reason uh, in the early uh, 19th century. Uh, that China, uh, the overall economic and also military or even cultural term and scientific uh, uh, and development um, in all, all sorts of, uh, of fields and dimensions have dropped following the economic uh, decline too. Now this is another chart uh, show 18 for China, again, uh, is, the, is the, the blue line. So starting from 1820, uh, it has been uh, uh, declining until almost the end of the last uh, century. It's not only China, but Asia as a whole. It's also declining. Uh, see, in the uh, very uh, early of the, um, um, in the first century, uh, Asia was number one, uh, without any doubt. And until almost the end of last century, uh, the share of uh, the Asians 
uh, GDP uh, among the global amount is shrinking very rapidly, and then it starts to rise again. And sometime also uh, in the year 2025, Asia would again exceed uh, particularly Western Europe and North America to be the world's number one continent in terms of uh, economic, I mean, in terms of uh, GDP. So that's the year of 1820, right? We, we should have a, a, another a talk to talk about why it happened. So we have seen, in the first place, China has been rising almost to a point that could uh, match the US. We also have seen in the past two centuries why China has been declining. Now, for uh, older people on the streets, um, they, they, I, I would argue that they have uh, two different sets of uh, uh, mentality uh, and how China and how Chinese see itself. Scenario uh, number one, rise of China, and this is a term that most of us are using quite widely. Rise of China, uh, as I said, China has been rising from nowhere, has been rising from poverty, has been uh, rising from kind of uh, uh, humiliation. So they, they, they try to do well. And China has benefited from the current order a lot. And uh, the ascending China is striving also within the existing international uh, order. And this order is established by the West. And if this is a liberal um, um, international system, it is open to everyone if you have the capability and you have the courage, you have the determi determination. You are welcome to, to come in. It is more integrated. We have a different region but the overall, in, in this growth, um, the economic, particularly trade relations are more integrated, and the, all the uh, governance of the international order should be based on the rule of law. So this is what actually the West has established in the past six decades. And in this uh, entire international order, the war has become uh, absolute. It's no longer uh, a tool for a rising power when you try to challenge the existing uh, power, thanks to partly thanks to nuclear deterrence. It's a bit ironic, but also thanks to globalization. So the possible result of this scenario would be the existing international order remains intact. And in this international order, China would happily, happily live with it and the U.S. is going to continue to lead us. At the another end of the uh, extreme of the <coughs> spectrum would be the Great Renaissance thesis. China, as I said, has suffered a lot from the current world order initiated by the West. This is the international order discriminated non-Western countries. And uh, if you look at the IMF, if you look at the uh, World Bank, even if you look at the uh, United Nations Security Council, the reason that China was included in the mid-40s uh, uh, was the existence of the, the US. Uh, otherwise, there would be only four uh, great powers in the UNSC. So China believed that this is not a very fair international uh, system. China, whenever possible, whenever um, powerful enough, is going to reshape the rules and institutions of the current international order to serve not only its own interests, but also for other emerging uh, economies, emerging countries, too. And other countries are going to perceive China either as an opportunity to work with or a threat. Um, particularly in recent years, countries around China, the Philippines, Vietnam, Japan, and some others uh, actually have been uh, perceived China as a, as a very formidable threat. So these countries are either going to be uh, joining the balancing uh, 
a camp or bandwagoning, bandwagoning to join uh, China or the other. So the possible result of this scenario would be the uh, kind of uh, power struggle between the two great powers for the world's and also regional leadership. And others have to choose side a kind of uh, uh, new Cold War to uh, uh, emerge, in particularly in, uh, uh, in East Asia. Anyway, these are scenarios. Uh, it needs a lot of debate. You know, when I travel around, sometimes the experts and analysts and officials ask me the same question. You know, we now have problems in South China Sea. We have problems in India, as I said to Amy some while ago, when I was visiting uh, uh, India. You remember, uh, I think it's in September last year, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping paid his first visit to New Delhi. And they had a very good time, and they played the swing. You, remen you remember the, the, the photo in Gujarat, the, um, the Prime Minister Modi's a, a, a province. They had a very uh, cozy afternoon, and wives, the first wives had tea. And all of a sudden, they received the news that the Chinese sent the troops across the border. So when I was there, the Chinese say, um, Security people, military people ask me. In, in, in Indian intelligence, there are two schools of thought. One is that they believe that they did this intentionally. You know, we can show you two faces. We can be friendly, but we can be your threat. Uh, you have to take us seriously. And the other school of thought is that this is an, an accident. And this uh, accident actually initiated by some. Uh, top generals in, in, in the region that they are not very happy with Xi Jinping. Um, well, I, I don't have information. We, we could argue about that. But this actually shows uh, how much the uh, people around the globe were asking the same question. What China really wants? My answer is very simple. I, I don't have answer to uh, for the question whether the Chinese uh, did that uh, intentionally to close the border back because it needs information, it needs te intelligence. But I could ask, I could answer this question, what China really wants. They want to be the world's number one. And on all dimensions, I mean, this is a, I know this is a very easy answer. But this is a very difficult picture that we could uh, actually think of. Why China want to be become that the world's number one. If you uh, ask Americans, um, I mean, some of my counterparts, they, they, they still at the NSC, at the uh, White House, at the um, State Department, they said that our strategic objective would be to continue to remain uh, the world's number one and um, to remain the American preeminence in Asia and elsewhere. But for all the rich America, they would answer otherwise. Um, again, Australian people, I ask you what, what would your country to be? You would have uh, thousands, millions, different questions. Everyone has a dream. But it's a country just so close to us, the largest population. And it's going to be the largest economy, the largest military, and it's still not a democratic country. And almost most of the people, if not all of the people, will tell you the, almost the same thing. We want to be number one. That is very formidable. So China, <coughs> they'd like to have China to become the world's number one or to return to this number one position. Again, these are two different uh, mindsets. I'm going to elaborate a bit later. So China tried very proactively to translate uh, its newly acquired power into great authority in a global system, economically, politically, culturally, you know, uh, on, on whatever dimension. So when would it happen? We know that it's going to happen in economic terms in a couple of years' time, but how about military 
and how about political, how about diplomatic, and how about military? If it happened, um, what would China do? Will China observe, bypass, or overthrow the existing order? Particularly if it's going to overthrow the existing order, country like Australia, like Taiwan, we are so familiar with the current order. We are so happy, at least I am happy, with the existing order. I cannot really um, speculate if an international order that is going to be dominated by the Chinese. Based on uh, past experiences, uh, there are some uh, experts concluding that in uh, our human uh, recent history, uh, there have been 15 cases that an existing power tried to overthrow, I'm sorry, a challenger tried to overthrow an existing great power, 15 cases. Guess how many of them uh, ended with a war? 15 cases. 11. Mm -hmm. And we really can't imagine if there is a war between the United States and China, Australia would be siding with the US, I believe, in one way or the other. Taiwan, difficult. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not a decision maker. Really difficult. Japan, according to the, uh, the US Japan Security Pact, Japan should be siding with the, the uh, the U.S., but how about South Korea? I mean, sometimes we, 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 we are so familiar with what actually we have been enjoying for so long, uh, it's really difficult for us to uh, project what's going to happen. Particularly, the situation is not what we could actually have imagined. Now, let me come back to this slide. The, uh, on the, the, the left-hand side, this is uh, the challenging power the 16 dominant power, and if Chinese power adopted the very limited uh, leverage to, to challenge the existing uh, great power, I mean limited meaning that uh, taking a step-by-step a, a, a -step approach and they are happily living with the current situation, um, they still um, uh, happy with how the existing great power kind of sharing power with the challenger. Revolutionary meaning trying to uh, change or even to destabilize the uh, status quo. Um, existing power will also have uh, two ways to uh, resist the challenge. Risk averse or risk acceptance. So this would be much more modest way that both sides dealing with each other, engagement, binding by institutions, mixed strategy in one way or the other. But if um, the existing one taking soft one, soft uh, measure or weak measure, and the challenger take a very strong uh, or even proactive or provocative uh, action, uh, both sides will take kind of containment or balancing meaning uh, AI with uh, medium uh, or small players so to become, to, to form some sort of a block vis-a-vis uh, -vis each other. And here again, a bit similar like this one. But how about if both sides are uh, aggressive, uh, very assertive or even very uh, provocative, then each side will be thinking to, to take a preventive move, uh, preventive for the, um, for the um, uh, existing one would be preventing you to become someone that could be capable of uh, challenging me for the challenger one would be uh, prevent you to standing in a way uh, for me to become a capable uh, competitor. So we have seen the, uh, the, the slide before. Uh, there are also two kinds of uh, uh, school of thought for the realism, excuse me, 
the international society is an anarchy uh, in which each nation will compete for its own power and security. Uh, so they, they don't have any mutual trust. And um, confrontation will become a phenomenon. Uh, the existing power will be striving for uh, continuing preeminence. The challenger will in, be engaging in any change of the status quo. So take the US and China as an example. China sees the US as a hegemonic power. The US sees China as an assertive power. So like many others, according to realists, the two great powers will be ended with a war. Now let me give you a, a more optimistic view. According to liberalism, the current international order, as I said, is an open, is multilateral, inclusive, globalized, highly interdependent. So both the great powers actually enjoy their uh, predominance in this international order. And the, um, the emerging country like China and other big countries too benefit from the current order. So the result would be China will observe a liberal international order where the US continues to lead, but also to share with the Chinese. We have seen some contradictory signs, right? Uh, the PLA is more powerful, and uh, there is also a very soft image of the Chinese. China has been very assertive in the past few years, particularly in places like South China Sea, East China Sea, and these are going to be uh, the sticking point for the two great powers. China also poses its charm offensive in many dimensions too. The next question would be whether the US is losing its hegemonic position. The world we have been known the world we are so familiar. The United States of America is the world's political leadership. And we observe here, America is in Vietnam, China. And we continue to believe that the US military supremacy is in the best interest of all. And the US also enjoys its cultural hegemony. But in the past, at least decade, this is the uh, figure showing that the, uh, the U.S. military spending following the Chinese, particularly after the 911 incident, the, uh, the, um, um, the military spending of the uh, U.S. also increased rapidly uh, in, the, in the past 10 years also. The U.S. put its all, most of its resources and attention on the war. On terror. The good side of this is that the U.S. has shifted it, its attention back to Asia, where they talk about return to Asia, uh, the pivot to Asia, rebalancing. I have no time to elaborate uh, each by, by each, but um, these are the three uh, main uh, terminology that have been used by the U.S. government in the past almost five years, pointing to different things, but the conclusion is that they are coming back. According to the former Secretary of State here of Clinton in uh, year of 2011, she pointed out that the US um, policy towards particular Asia and also foreign policy as a whole will focus on these six, uh, starting from uh, strengthening its alliance relations to pursuing its military and I'm going to show you. In Asia alone, the US has a five treaty alliance with Japan, with Korea, with the Philippines, with Thailand, of course, with your great country. And you also enjoy some semi-alliance or a friendly relation with countries like Taiwan, um, Malaysia, Singapore. And these formal or informal uh, alliance relationships actually form a very firm foundation for the U.S. Uh, 
biometric preeminence in all part of the world. And I believe that uh, based on this uh, diagram, at uh, least uh, picture, we have to find uh, how each of us can strengthen our relation. For instance, I should draw a line from here and here, Taiwan and Australia. Finally, what would be the implication? China is going to be number one. We have to ask ourselves, are we well prepared for, for that? Not yet. Uh, many of us still are not very comfortable for the part that we've done. Um, are, are we really afraid of uh, uh, number one China? It really depends upon how China would look like 20 years down the road, uh, how it could act militar militarily, economically, uh, is, is it going to be the core of facilitating inclusive regional integration or exclusive in regional integration? Particularly, it has to be tolerant, open, liberal, and culturally, it should uh, expand its influence on various, not power. And this slide shows you that it's not only China. Asia as a, as a whole, including Australia, is increasing. And how this uh, in, in entire Asia, along with China, is going to contribute to the world as a whole. What we can do all together. I hope that the US will actually reform the international order, the existing international order, to share more power and share more interest with countries like China, like India, Russia, and many others, and smaller players too. And we have to actually think of some sort of uh, regional security architecture to transform the current bilateral uh, security pact to become a multilateral platform where all of us could address and solve our common problems. And small, smaller players like us, we are in the same boat. The boat is not very big. But we should all be a boat. Um, we should not choose side. We have a lot of uh, means to uh, prevent these two great powers from the war, but also from when they combine together to threat, threaten smaller players like us. So no more cold wars in Asia for these two great powers. Finally, Taiwan plus Australia. But naturally, we have institutionalized our relations. We, we have to establish some sort of a track 2 or track 1.5 uh, platform involving specialists from officials, academics, industry. Uh, multilaterally, we have to advocate as a big country like you and small player like us uh, to advocate kind of inclusive multilateral mechanism in economic terms. In, in, um, in security terms and also in critical terms. And we should uh, welcome the idea to form the AP. And strategically, the best interest for all of us is to continue to maintain the US preeminence in your country, in my country, in, and also in our entire region. Finally, I took a very beautiful photo. <laughs> In front of my room, I stay in the university uh, house. It really reminds me of my time in the UK, but you are a very different country. It is much more peaceful, quieter, uh, but it's a great country. Uh, when I saw in the garden, you can ask Kevin. Uh, I said to him, I'd like to come here. This is my very first time to be here, so then it's not going to my last. And I when I come back to my country, I would uh, suggest to the government, to the people here, that we should continue to strengthen our bilateral relations. And these two countries are going to form a very firm foundation for the current international order and for the international order that is going to exist for the next 20, 30 years down the road. Thank you so much.